next. Um, you know, technology is changing dr dramatically about uh, the, the work we do inside of, inside of uh, our, our operations and, um, and machine learning is, is putting on a whole new layer of understanding. We used to outsource uh, this work. We now have a full uh, lead person in charge of consumer and data analytics reporting to the CEO and uh, it's, it's such a big important part of, of, of how we think about the consumer. You know, and as Chris said, it's, it's, it's about individual consumers. It's no longer about your average consumer. It's about individuals. You got to be relevant uh, on a local basis. How's machine learning and some of this new technology, Greg, going to change the way you do business? Well, you may think we're a little, little farm store, but we spend a lot of money on technology every year. And uh, my CIO, myself, and a, a core team have really acknowledged that uh, artificial intelligence was what was going to drive the business. We launched a program, uh, let's see, and this was probably June of last year. It's cycled a full year here in June coming up, called Neighbors Club. Now, why do we call it that? It, it's a loyalty or a, a, well, I'll call it an affinity program, but its, its object was to capture information from the consumer then have the, the systems behind the house analyze that information and help us understand where these customers are going, where they're moving, why they're buying what they're buying. And I'll give you an example. Um, we've already found that through our own research and through the purchasing patterns of our equine customers, we have a very large equine business. 90% of them have dogs. So if we're noticing that they're not purchasing in our pet food category and they're only purchasing equine product from us, we now have an opportunity to talk to them in a very direct way about a new category of business. And we're already starting to test that and use that information. So the uh, artificial intelligence component, we have a whole team of people now that we put into place that we didn't have two years ago. And their jobs, and most of them are Vandy mathematicians, to be very honest, <laughs> very smart young people who understand how to crunch numbers and look for these, these comparisons and these, these relationships between consumer buying patterns. And this is how we reach through Neighbors Club out to our consumers. Now, what's unique about Tractor, believe this or not, 51% of our sales come through the register in greenbacks, actual cash. Mm. So how do you track that customer? <laughs> not easy. So this is one of the reasons we had to get Neighbors Club into play, because we were losing that data. The customers typically don't want to be questioned when they come to the register. You know, Can I have your phone number, your this or that and the other, your address or whatever? It was very cumbersome. So. Neighbors Club is a way to get them involved, we get that information, and now we can start mining that information. So we're on the precipice of all of this. I will tell you, initially, it's looking very promising. Should be able to drive the business, but I can't say that it's going to give me the kind of comps I need today, but I think six months, a year down the road, 18 months, it's going to be quite exciting. The personalization piece, to your point, is just so critical, and we've been Probably the biggest investments we've made over the last number of years has been in the systems, the tools, and the talent to be able to do that. We've been working very closely with IBM and their whole Watson team. And if you think about it for HSM, what's going to be important given the percent of our business that's done through a digital platform, we have to go from one broadcast or one communication to 96 million people to 96 million personalized experiences. And that's very different. And you know, we've had to build out a team because our ability to do that, not only do you keep the customer longer, because in, in our world, it's getting that first time customer to become a second time customer. And once she becomes a third time customer, I have her for life. Um, so it's very important that when we communicate, it's at a very personal level because that's what people expect today. And the other thing that they expect is, Everyone today is your competitor. It's not just another retailer. If they had an experience on Uber or Airbnb, that's your new competitor. It's about that personalized experience. And the artificial intelligence, the learning, the data is table stakes today. Terry, I think there's a real opportunity for the student and faculty here in, in the school to think about the future capabilities that companies like ours and others who we compete with will look for. Um, there will always be a combination of art and science in retailing. We're tilting a little bit to science these days and quantitative capability is something we're adding at incrementally faster rates than any other capability in our company. I wouldn't have thought five years ago we would be adding data scientists. Um, but this personalization is really a quantitative challenge. 
and we look for our merchants to have advanced quantitative capabilities that we didn't think as much about as we did four or five years ago. It's emerged and something for the faculty and students to consider as you build your own personal capabilities as a student, but also the, the future curriculum for students from a, from a faculty perspective will be critically important. Agree. Uh, so much, and it's you know we, we're all going to speculate um, about just what's in front of us. But I think Bill Gates said it best. He, he said we 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 have a tendency when it comes to technology and you know advancements in technology to overestimate what we can do in the next five years, but grossly underestimate what will be done in the next ten years. And I think I think that's actually a good way for us to uh, to frame frame this this subject. But um, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that. At, a little later, later on, but you know, so with the, the students are on my mind, and uh, we spent a lot of time with them. I was on campus um, yesterday, and, and uh, so was my CFO, Karen Hogay, was here speaking to the business school, and and so we're, you know, we try to spend a lot of time just talking about to, to these young people about getting excited about our our, our companies as a careers, our industries as careers. But what about trying to attract them to come shop with you right now? These, uh, these, these today, you know, and then they're, 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 they're in their 20s, you know, they're starting to think about their, their careers, they're going to have some pocket change to spend, they're going to need some wardrobe changes probably, I'm guessing. Uh, not, not my students, my students look fabulous, by the way, <laughs> but I saw some of the other students on campus, they need some help. Uh, and so, uh, so what, are, but what, are, what are we going to do each of you to, to um, including Matt, to tell us the, about your, your thoughts. What are we going to do um, to get them to shop with us? Matt, why don't you try to take that from a general perspective? So, so I think, you know, um, sitting, talking to all these retailers, but sitting in Washington, I guess, sort of um, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So looking at this from the policy perspective of what, what Washington can do, um, you know, we had a political commentator named Ron Brownstein speak yesterday. Uh, to the executive committee, uh, CNN contributor and, a, and an Atlantic uh, monthly um, writer. And one of the things that Ron talked about that many of us have observed and, and heard about, and I think it's been pretty well publicized, is that uh, income in the United States per family has not grown since the t essentially in real terms since Bill Clinton was president. And that's the first time. That's that, the first that, time in that children have not had seen a future greater than their, their parents. And, and, and I think that's got real implications because it impacts uh, obviously spending ability and the strength of the consumer, although we know right now that the consumer economy appears to be very strong and consumer confidence has been high and debt is down and wages are increasing and unemployment is down. So I mean there are lots of positives, but there's this massive transformation um, in the way in which people spend and the way in which their dollars get allocated. And so from the perspective of what things need to happen, we do need to get the economy growing again. We need to create more jobs, and as job growth has tailed off uh, over the last few years from 2014, 15, 16, and this year, now we see 167,000 jobs per month. Uh, three years ago, that was 250,000. And so it's been decreasing, and that's got implications uh, for all of us. And, and I think it really goes to um, you know, what, what everyone up here has talked about is, th is that experience of how you get someone in the store, whether you're meeting them where they are, whether it's distributed economy or whether it's thinking about your real estate differently. And, and uh, Shane and I were speaking a little bit earlier about if you go back 20 years and think that um, the legacy retail uh, on the bricks and mortar side was that in terms of a football field or a soccer pitch, the bricks and mortar guys were in one end zone and the online guys were in the other end zone. And that's the way the game got played 20 years ago. And now the game is being played somewhere closer to the middle of the field. And, and, and that combination of uh, the way in which you deploy your resources and you structure your organization, bring in the right talent, uh, I think all those things are going to combine, hopefully, in a growing economy to get people to spend and to shop. Chris, how are you going to get people to come into uh, BJ's that, yeah. that, are, that are this younger um, generation that are shopping differently than our parents or, our, or we were shopping? I think Mindy said it best, this, this thought of distributed content and being prepared to deal with a consumer wherever they choose to deal with us is, is, a, is now table stakes. But the, the thing we've worked really hard on um, is being really clear on our targets. And we, we will tend to attract students like these as they start to form their families. 
and value becomes increasingly important. And um, our ability to be much more targeted around new family formation, that's when a club store becomes relevant. We're not that relevant to college kids. But when these folks go out and have their families and they figure out diapers and formula costs a lot of money and all the other things and, some, and somehow one person in their family doesn't work anymore, money matters and we can play a significant role in that regard. And the work we've done with companies like Procter & Gamble, where you're a director, to attract those newly formed families in urban settings has been a compelling marketing challenge for our company and one we continue to try and get better at all the time. I think it's really about understanding your brand and creating the greatest relevance depending on who you think that target audience is. So similar to you in our HSM business, our target entry point is really that millennial mom. Um, probably just had kids, doesn't have a lot of time, wants curated experiences. Um, so that's different than our Grand and Road brand, for example, which we're really working a lot to almost relaunch it to new audience for first apartment um, and making sure we have the right product. But how we communicate that in a digital world and with content is going to be very different. Another example of that is, you know, we're in so many categories of business and not everything's created equal. The beauty business, for example, is an unbelievable business for a broad spectrum of audience. But how we target our audience digitally is very different than what we'll do on a television screen and who are the influencers for them. So we now have partnered with the younger beauty influencers and the younger indie beauty brands and we're creating all new content to use their social equity to bring us new audience. But then we have to make sure our subsequent communication to them is relevant so they want to stay as a customer. Um, so now when we launch something from Too Faced, for example, we don't even launch it on TV first, we launch it on Instagram. So it's, it's just changing the method of the communication, but then also determining what doesn't make sense. Right, exactly.